Good morning and welcome back to Kabbalah and Coffee. Being that we are uh, about four weeks before the 4th of Shvat, then this 10th of Shvat, which is the previous Rebbe's yard site and the day that the Rebbe assumed the leadership of the Chabad movement and became the Rebbe. I want to teach the Maimer, the discourse, Basilagani, that was published by the previous Rebbe one day before he passed away. For his, for that Shabbos, he published it for Shabbos, Yud Shvat, the 10th of Shvat, 1950. And many have seen this discourse, it's a discourse that was delivered, that was published in four parts. It has 20 chapters. The first five were published for that Shabbos. And that day, the previous Rebbe passed away. Many have seen this my discourse as his last will and testament. And uh, in it, he discusses and hints, as you will see soon, to the uh, seventh generation, which he was the sixth Rebbe, and he talks about the six great le- seven great leaders. So there's hints over here, and and uh, talks the the, the 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 gist of the Mimer is about bringing God down to earth, creating for God the home that he desired when he created the world, but in a very, you know, in great detail. And uh, subsequently, what the Rebbe went ahead and did is the next 40 years, till he stopped saying discourses, he said, for example, in 1951, when he officially became, took over the leadership, he delivered on that day, Yud Shvat, a mimer, also a discourse beginning with the words Basi Lagani. And every year he elaborated on another chapter of the previous Rebbe's discourse. So it took 20 years to, uh, of elaboration. When he finished 20 years, he started again with new elaborations and new explanations. So we have 40, about 40, 38 to be exact, 38 discourses of Basi Lagani of the Rebbe, and one of the previous Rebbe. So we are going to learn today the previous Rebbe's discourse. I'm told that we did this already once, so if we did, I'm sure those that are watching certainly didn't hear it, but even those that are here, I can always learn it again, so I hope you can also enjoy learning it again. But till Yutzvat we'll do this. Yutzvat is, as I said, in about three or four weeks. As you can see in the beginning on top, it says the following Maimah comprising chapters 1-5, which is the first chapter, which is the first section of this discourse, part one of it, a series of discourses, with the general title of Basil Ghani, was released in advance for study on Shabbos Parshas Boy, Yud Shvat, of 1950, 57-10, in honor of the yard set of the author's grandmother, the saintly Rebbe Sinrifke. She also passed away on the 10th of Shvat, So he released this discourse, and this also was then the discourse that uh, that was also turned out to be his own (laughs) yard sign. I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. This is a posik in Shira Shirim in the Song of Songs. King Solomon says that God said, I've come into my garden, my sister, my bride. Shira Shirim, the Medrash explains, is not to be taken at face value. It is a metaphor describing the ongoing relationship between God and His Bride, the Jewish people. The above verse, for example, refers to the time of the construction of the sanctuary, the temple, when the Shekhinah came into His garden, for it was then that the Divine Presence, distant for a time, was again revealed in this world. So when God says, I've come to my garden, by the way, these brackets are not in the original discourse. This, the translator is adding this for better understanding. So these are not the, free, the previous Rebbe's words. But he says here that the Shira Shirim is a metaphor for the relationship between God and the Jewish people. And he says, I've come to my garden. He means I've come back to this world where I was once. And now with the building of the Beis Hamikdash, I was distant for a while. And now with the building of the Beis Hamikdash, I have been I'm brought back. The Hebrew word for the, that means to my garden is now discussed. The Medrash Rabbah on the, on the above verse observes 
that the word used is not legan, it doesn't say bossy legan, which would mean I have come to the garden, but legani, which means to my garden. And the emphasis here is as follows, and this implies legnuni, which means to my bridal chamber, for as the commentaries on the Medrash explain, this possessive form implies a private place, my garden, such as the chamber in which the spiritual union of groom and bride is consummated. The Divine Presence is thus saying, I have come into my bridal chamber, into the place in which my essence was originally revealed. It has been a, I'm here, be, it's my, because, mine because I was once here. This is not a new place for me. When God says, I've come down to this earth again, my Shechina was brought back onto earth, it's not a new experience for Hashem. He was already once here, and therefore He calls it Legani, to my bridal chair, to my place, to my... The Madrash continues, you understand? The Madrash continues, in the beginning the essence of the Shekhinah was apparent in the, this lowly world. When God created the world, the essence of Hashem was present here in a revealed state. However, in the wake of the cosmic sin of the tree of knowledge, the Shekhinah departed from the earth and rose into the heavens. It was removed from this earth. Later on, Later, on account of the sin of Cain, that killed Abel, yeah? And then of Enosh, another sin of another later generation, uh, involved in idol worship and so on and so forth, the Shekhinah withdraw even further from this world, rising from the nearest heaven to the second, and then to the third. With every sin, he was removed another level. Later yet, the sins of the generation of the deluge caused it to the flood caused it to recede from the third heaven to the fourth, and so on. This progressive recession of the revealed divine presence is alluded to in the wording of the verse that relates that Adam and Eve heard the sound of God walking about in the garden. After the sin of the tree of knowledge, it says that Adam and Eve heard God walking in the, in the garden. Right? So over there it says, Rabbi Abba notes, the verse did not use the expected form of the verb mahalich, but rather mishalich. It says that they heard the voice of Hashem mishalich bagon. It doesn't say mahalich, which would mean walking in the garden. It says mishalich with an extra tough. What's this extra tough? This suggests that they heard the divine presence springing back in successive stages of withdrawal. Mishalich means skipping, jumping. What does that mean? He was, being, he was removed in the successive stages from the earth. In other words, he was being pushed further up and further up from the seventh heaven, I'm sorry, from the first heaven to the second to the third, all the way up to the seventh heaven through these seven sins. So that's the illusion here in, in, in the, in the Pasuk. Anyway, so what do we have here? That first, in the beginning, when God created the world, the divine the Shekhinah was present, the essence of Hashem was present here on earth, in full glory. But the sin, and Adam and observed it. Adam and Eve observed that essence of Hashem was revealed to them. What happened? They sinned. And when they sinned, they removed the Shekhinah, the, rev, the, the, the revelation of the Shekhinah was then removed from the earth was pushed upward to the heavens, but only to the first heaven, which is close to earth in spiritual terms. Then the second sin removed it even further, all the way up seven sins removed it seven heavens, seven stages, okay? The Midr, the Medrash then proceeds to explain that after the sins of the seven generations that caused had caused the Divine Presence to withdraw seven spiritual levels from this in its initial manifestation in this world, and came seven, Sadiqim arose, whose divine service drew the divine presence down once more into this below, into the, this world below. Yeah? Then started a reversal of this disaster. With the seven Sadiqim started bringing him back down. Where are we? Yeah, through the merit of Avram, the first of these tzaddikim, the Shekhinah was brought down from the seventh heaven to the sixth. 
through the merit of Yitzchol, the Shechina was brought down from the sixth heaven to the fifth, and so on until Mesha, the seventh of these Sadikim, and all those who are the seventh are cherished. This is an interesting uh, parenthesis, which is in the, this is not a bracket, this is a parenthesis. The parentheses are in the original text of the previous Rebbe. And he says over here, he throws in the words, and all sevens are cherished. What do you get from this? It's an, uh, an, uh, an unmistakable uh, r- reference to, to the Rebbe, which is the seventh generation, as you'll see soon. And all sevens are cherished. So he, uh, so Mesha, the seventh of these Sadiq drew the revelation of the Shechina down once again into this world below. Meishe Rabbeinu finally brought it back down from the first heaven to the earth. Where? In the Beis Amikdash, when he built the Shechina, when he built the Mishkan. It said, that's what Basiligani means. I've come to my garden. Finally, I'm back to where I was once before. Understood? Are there any questions? Divinity was primarily revealed in the Beis Amikdash. As it is written, And they shall make me a sanctuary, and I shall dwell within them. Significantly, the last Hebrew word of the verse is not as expected, which would mean within it, because they only built one Beis Amikdash, one Mishkan. So it should have said, build me a Mishkan and I will dwell within it. But it doesn't say within it, it says within them. The same, but so when they had the altar, for instance, at uh, Shiloh and the different those other spots were yeah. the different, uh, like Eli and yeah, yeah. Th- there was no there was yeah, they, yeah, but there. those were one at a time. When this one was over, they built one in Shiloh. When Shiloh was no longer in existence, they built one in Naive and Given, and then in Yerushalayim. But the Shekinah didn't. Uh, appear until the the, the Mishkan the Mishkan no no the Mishkan is referring to as the one in the desert oh, oh okay. this Meish Rabbein is okay. Mishkan that was the first yeah. not Shlomo okay. not Shlomo no this, is a per, this verse is in the in the Torah by Meish okay. God says to make me a Mikdash and I will dwell in them but the Seichon which means within them for God craves a dwelling place within each individual Jew so that's why it says within them and each one of us so this, so the way did Meish Rabbeinu bring God back down to, to earth, primarily in the base Hamikdash, but a little, but, but in a sense, in every one of us, if we want. This concept can grant us an insight into the verse Sadikim Yirshu Oras Viyishkan Olad Olah. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell forever upon it. That's what it says in Tehillim. What is the meaning of this? Now, the word la'ad, forever, here translated forever, recalls the word ad in the phrase, Sheikhin ad morim v'kodesh shemei. He who dwells forever, exalted and holy is his name. So the word la'ad is the same as the word ad in the other statement, in the other uh, phrase, which means forever, right? Our verse may thus be understood as follows. The righteous will inherit the land, which is an allusion to Gan Eden, to paradise. Because why will they inherit the land? The par- why will they be rewarded with paradise? Because they cause him who dwells forever, exalted and holy is his name, to dwell and be revealed in this physical world below. You understand? What he's saying over here is like this. The simple way to understand the verse in Tehillim is simple. The ver- righteous, look at the second line. The righteous will inherit the land, meaning Gan Eden, for, uh, and dwell forever upon it. They'll always be in Gan Eden. They will dwell forever Allah upon it. But the Rebbe is saying, the previous Rebbe is interpreting it a bit different. That's of course true too. But he's making a reference, the word la'ad over here, it doesn't mean that they forever, they will dwell there forever. He's saying no, la'ad means a Hashem. 
just like in the phrase Sheikhan Ad, he who dwells forever, meaning Hashem. So the here too, the word La'ad means Hashem. And what, how does he therefore translate this verse in Tehillim? Our verse may thus be understood as follows. That the Rai, he splits it in two, the verse. Tzadikim Yirshu Oretz, the righteous will inherit the land, which is an allusion to Gan Eden. Why? Because V'yishken O'la'ad O'leha. Because they cause him who dwells forever, Hashem, exalted and holy is his name, to be dwell and be revealed in this physical world below. Hmm. So that's what the tzaddik, in other words, what he's trying to get at is that's what the tzaddik can do. That's their main function. To bring, to, to cause the Hashem himself, the essence of the Shechina, to, re, to dwell here on earth. And that's what Meshach Rabbeinu did. All the seven tzaddikim told Meshach, which was the seventh, and the seventh are cherished, brought down the Shechina down here to earth. Back, from, to, back to earth. With this in mind, namely, revelation of the divine presence in the sanctuary and more particularly the revelation of the divine dimension within him, within himself in with which each individual secures through the construction of his personal sanctuary so with this in mind we can better understand the interpretation of the verse i have come to, into my garden as i have come into my bridal chamber in other words the shekhinah speaks of its return to the original location of its essential abode in the midst of the nether beings down here on earth. You understand? The Shem is saying, I've come back, not I've come as the first time. And that's why he uses the language Ligani, to my garden. What's my garden? He was never here. How could it be his garden? No, because he was here. He's returning, not coming as a first, uh, for, for first visit. Now the ultimate purpose for the creation of the spiritual and physical worlds was that God desired to have a dwelling place in the lowest world, lower worlds. As we know, this is a famous statement of the Medrash. He desired that divinity be revealed even on the material plane below by means of man's divine service of subordinating and transforming his physical nature. First subordinating and then transforming. There's two things here. You understand the difference? Subordination means you break it down. Meaning, bros, break it down. Mean? It means like this: you have, for example, a, a slave who's subordinated to his to his master. The slave has his own agenda. He has his own desires and his own wills. He'd rather be running for wild and doing whatever he wants, but he submits to the master. The master subordinates him and tells you're going to do what I want. That's first. So you have a negative nature, right? You have certain negative desires to do things that you shouldn't be, really want, shouldn't do. So the first thing a yid has to do is subordinate it. Don't let it get out. Don't let it, don't give in to those desires. Subordinate it. The Yitzhahara, right? But the second thing is, the second, uh, the ultimate goal is transformation. That your nefesh abahamis, your animalistic soul, or what we call in the Tanya, the human soul, the, that, that part of the person, should be transformed where it, it too wants to have a connection with Hashem. No, now no longer is it forced because the because you're not letting it do the, the wrong things, but now it too wants this. That's transformation. So first is subordination, then transformation. And that's what God wanted. That was his ultimate desire. Read it again. He desired that divinity be revealed even on the material be uh, plane below in this physical world by means of man's divine service of subordinating and transforming his physical nature. Because the physical nature is not godly, as you know. It's not really too, too interested in God's business. It likes to sleep. It likes to eat. It likes to on vacations, likes to buy good things, like nice, beautiful things. So that has to be subordinated and then transformed. He desired that the divine soul descend from its spiritual heights and become enclosed in a body with an animal soul.
which would conceal and obscure the divine soul's light. Yeah? That's what he wanted. That what? That the divine soul should descend from its spiritual heights. Where does Anishama come from? The highest of it. And become enclosed in a body with an animal soul. Yeah? Which would conceal and obscure the divine soul's light. And despite all this, through the study of Teda and the observance of the commandments, the divine soul would refine and purify the body and the animal soul as well as its portion in the world and, in other words, its environment. This, then, is the meaning of the above-quoted verse, and, I, and they shall make me a sanctuary, and I shall dwell within them, within each individual Jew. The individual brings about this revelation of the divine presence within this personal sanctuary through his divine service of sifting and refining materiality by subordinating and transforming his physical nature. In this spirit it is written when the sitra achra, meaning literal, the other side, meaning the cosmic force opposing holiness, when that is subdued, the glory of God rises thereby and is diffused throughout all the worlds. Now this is a statement that Rebbe is now going to elaborate on. So I need you, I want you to really pay attention to this statement. Let's read it again. In this spirit it, it is written, when the Sitra Achra, the other side, the cosmic forces opposing holiness, when that is subdued, when that is subdued, the glory then, what does it accomplish? It accomplishes that the glory of, of God rises thereby and is diffused throughout all the worlds. So now he explains. When the phrase throughout all the worlds is used by the Zohar, this is a Zoharic statement, by the way. So when the phrase throughout all the worlds is used by the Zohar, it intends to describe a level of divine light that is diffused equally in all worlds. You understand what he's saying over here? All worlds, what does all worlds mean? The highest to the lowest. So when it says, again let's read the previous, uh, the statement itself in the previous paragraph, the last three lines. When the Sitra Achra is subdued, the glory of God rises thereby and is diffused throughout all the worlds. What does it mean? What's being diffused throughout all the worlds? So he says over here now, when the phrase throughout all the worlds is used by the Zohar, it intends to describe a level of divine light that is diffused equally in all worlds. How can it be diffused equally? Oh, so now he's going to explain. Now, it, it, this is, we're talking therefore about a transcendent order of divine illumination that the Kabbalah calls Seviv Kol Alman. What is Seviv Kol Alman? In talk, we're talking over here about such a light. Let me explain it first orally. We're talking about over here such a light that is so lofty that Atzil is compared to it. Atzil is the highest world. And Asiyah, the lowest world, is all equal. And that's why it can be diffused everywhere equally. In other words, it's so much higher than all the world that the highest and the lowest is all the same. That's what we accomplish when we subdue the negative side. To bring about such a revelation of godliness that we refer to as Savior Kalam. Savior Kalam means encompassing all the worlds. That means the highest and the lowest is all the same. That's the light that we bring into this world. Let's see it in the Rebbe's words. The light of Savior Kalman is unique. The spiritual world exists at various levels. In the higher realms, the divine light shines forth in overt revelation. While in the lower realms, the revelation is not so apparent, as apparent. At certain levels, the light is even hidden and obscure. So obviously in Atzilus there's a greater revelation of godliness than in Bria. And in Bria there's more than in Yitzira. In Yitzira more less, but more than Asiya. And Asiya is even less. In our physical world it's completely uh, obscured. The Medrash refers to this variety of levels in its comment on the verse, Af yodi yosta oritz vimini tip My hand establishes the earth and my right hand spanned the heavens. So the Medrash declares, it declares, in this verse it declares, he stretched out his right hand and created the heavens, he stretched out his left hand and created the earth. Metaphorically, obviously. 
What's the difference between right and left? So he says, it is, as is known, the right hand signifies a greater light and more overt revelation than does the left. And this right hand created the heavens, signifying the highest spiritual realms. So that was created by the right hand, meaning that was in those worlds there's a greater revelation of light, where the divine light is both more intense and more revealed. There's more intense light, and even and that more intense light is more revealed. You understand the difference, yeah? The left hand, by contrast, created the earth, the lower realms, signifying the lower spiritual realms, where the divine light is both less intense and more concealed. In other words, you could ha- you could say, in all worlds is the same e- is the same amount of godliness, but in the higher world it's more revealed, in the lower world it's more concealed. But it's not what he's saying. He's saying that in addition to re- revelation and concealment, there's even there's there's more, there's more intense and less intense. In that seal is there's a more, greater intensity intensity of light, and that is more revealed as well. Wouldn't have to be. What? Wouldn't it have to be? Maybe. No, it doesn't have to be. But down here we couldn't handle it. I don't think. That's why it's concealed. You can say it's the same light, but concealed. You say no, it's less light, and even that less is even even that you can't see. This concept can be grasped more completely through comprehension of the differences between the four spiritual realms alluded to in the verse Kolanikra Bishmi Vulchvedi Barasi Vitsarti Vafasisi. All that is called by my name, it is for my glory. And I created it, formed it, and indeed made it. And this verse is an allusion to the four spiritual worlds. These worlds alluded in descending order to the four worlds, to the four stages of the creative process. The manner of illumination in Atsilas differs from that in the other three worlds. For in Atsilas, that divine energy which had been concealed becomes revealed. Significantly, the root eight cell. You understand? May not go too fast. If I want you to understand what he's saying over here. What is Atzilus? Atzilus is a world where the light becomes completely revealed. It's total revelation in Atzilus. God is revealed completely in Atzilus. Significantly, he says it's even hinted in the world Atsilus itself. What does Atsilus mean? The root Aitzel. Atsilus, Aitzel, right? Of the Hebrew word Atsilus has two very different meanings. A, next to. Right? Aitzel means next to. And B, separate. On the one hand, he's saying Atsilus is separate enough from its source to be c- categorized as a world. It's considered already separate from the, from the essence of Hashem. It's, it's already a world. It's an entity. On the other hand, it never ceases to be one of the infinite worlds of the Yen Sof. It's still part of God's of godliness. It's part of the Yen Sof, the infinite reality of Hashem. It's still close enough, in other words. It's a separate entity, but close enough. This is not the case with the worlds of Briyat. Where, there, where we see the beginnings of seemingly independent existence. Atsilus is not independent existence, it's still part of pure godliness. The creation of something from nothing already. Bri is already a separate entity. So what's Atsilus? Atsilus is the first of the world, which is pure godliness. So it is a revelation of the Yen Sof. It's intense light and revealed light. It's all good. In the above quoted verse, the phrase my name and my glory signify a state of being that is still at one with its divine source. Again, in the above quoted verse, the phrase my name, you remember the verse he's talking about? All that is called by my name, yeah, it is for my glory, yeah. In the above quoted verse, the phrases my name and my glory signify, it's calling it mine, yeah? My name, my glory. It's already, it's talking with Hashem. It's, it signifies state of being that is still at one with its divine source. It's, it's Hashem's. It's one, my name, my glory. This is, they thus refer to the world of Atsilas, which is still integrally united with its source, a world in which the divine light shines forth in utter revelation. 
the divine revelation, the other three worlds and the lower three worlds is very different. Inasmuch as they are creations and hence perceive themselves as having an identity distinct from that of their source, so it's already much lower, much less. Moreover, as they separate, <coughs> as their separate names indicate, Briya, Yitzira, and Asiya, there are differences in the degree of light received by each. The differentiation, however, which varies with the absorptive capacity of each realm is true only of that manner of divine illumination that animates the various worlds in, imminently. This kind of light is called memalakal almin, that which fills all the world. This paragraph is crucial for you to understand. Not that the others aren't, but this is, you need to understand, because where, how do we get into this? He said that the Hashem, the Zohar says that when a yid that does David, the divine service of subduing the Sitra Achre that diffuses Hashem's essence in all the worlds. And he went ahead and said that the statement in all the worlds refers to such a light that is in all worlds equally. And he referred to it as Seiv of Kalalman, the light that encompasses Hashem's infinite light that encompasses all worlds. What's Seiv of Kalalman? In order to understand Seiv of Kalalman, he wants you to first understand Memal of Kalalman. What's Memal of Kalalman? That's this progression, the Seder Ishtalashlis, the progression of light that. In, it animates and creates all the different levels and worlds, right? So first you have Atzilus, then you have Bria. In that system of light and the revel, godly revelation, it's not in all worlds equally. Mm-hmm. Atzilus is much more and the Bria is less and so on and so forth. And that's what he's saying. About it. This differentiation, however, which varies with the absorptive capacity of each realm, Atzilus can absorb more, Bria less and so on, is true only of that manner of divine illumination that animates the various worlds imminently. It encloses itself in those worlds and becomes part of it and so on and so forth. This kind of light is called Memalo Kalaman, that which fills all the worlds, like the soul fills the body, right? In different parts of the body, there's different parts of the soul. Same thing over here, in the, in the, in the God that fills the world, the godly light that fills and animates the worlds in a in a very close, imminent way, that's Memalukalama with this progression, these lower levels and lower, higher and lower. But there is another kind of light. A light that is oblivious to the particular limitations of the various realms. Transcending them all. It illuminates them equally. This kind of light is called Sevev Kalam. Literally that which encompasses all the world. When the above mentioned quotation of the Zohar spoke of the glory of God rising and being diffused through all, throughout all the worlds. It was speaking of this kind of light, which is absorbed by all the worlds equally, which means is the highest level of light. Where lower and higher is insignificant. There is no lower and higher regarding that light. And if this light is to be elicited and drawn into all the worlds, man must labor at his task of birudim, sifting and refining materiality by subordinating and transforming his physical nature. This is what is meant by the above statement from the Zohar, when the Sitra Achra is subdued, in other words, when by laboring at his divine service, a Jew subjugates the forces of unholiness and darkness in, in, in Again, when, by, no, when, when, a, when by laboring at where am I? No, when by laboring at his divine service, a Jew subjugates the forces of unholiness and darkness is transformed into light. Then, suing light is superior because it issues from the darkness. But here, he is bringing out a light out of the darkness. He's breaking the darkness, and that, and, and through that, bringing about a godly light. This is a by, whole different level of godly light. Himself, himself, and yet, yeah, of course, himself. When darkness itself is thus transformed into light, this light is superior, in that its illumination is manifest even in this physical world. Below, it is drawn equally in all worlds. Because hmm. when you're talking about the essence of Hashem, there is no higher and lower. Higher and lower is only in that level of light that it encloses itself in the world. But that light that encompasses all the world, it's, the same. it's all the same. Wow. That's what we draw when we do this. 
In these terms, let's just finish up. In these terms, we can understand the above quoted statement of the Zohar. When the Sitra Achra is subdued, the glory of God rises thereby and is diffused throughout all the worlds. This refers to the transcendent level of divine light, that which is Savior of Kalalman, whose diffusion equally encompasses all worlds below and above. This, as explained above, is what is meant by the verse, and they shall make me a sanctuary, and I shall dwell within them, within each individual Jew, throughout his labors. That's, I'm sorry, through his labors in the divine service of subjugating this, his physical nature and transmuting darkness into light. In this way, the resultant light is enhanced and the glory of God rises and is diffused throughout all the world for the transcendent light of Seva Kalaman is thereby revealed. And that's Bosi Lugani. That's what is accomplished by, but so that's the sanctuary that we built for him by subjugating the negative. And then we have the accomplishment of the God says, I can return back to where, where I was, what was here before, the sins. Not Mimalo Kalam, it was the essence of Hashem. That which encompasses, it's the highest level of light. Is this also the same, Rabbi, within each individual Jew, what, what each individual Jew does affects, what you just talking about, the, 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 whole Jew, world. the whole world, absolutely. It does, yeah. When the Yid breaks his nature, he doesn't do what he wants to do, because Hashem doesn't want him to do it. It brings about the essence of Hashem into this world. Because that was his desire. That was the essence of Hashem's desire. The essence of the three, the summary, and then we'll go down. The essence of the Shechina was apparent in the lower world. The chapter explains that the ultimate purpose of the world's creation is God's desire for a dwelling place in the lower world. This terrestrial abode is constructed through man's divine service, subduing so and transforming his physical nature. In this manner, he causes the <coughs> transcendent light of Seva Kalam, which illuminates all worlds equally, to be revealed. In the second chapter is going to explain more specifically what it is that we have to do in order to accomplish this. So the light that Aveda of Karbonis. What's, what was in the temple, the main service? Sacrifices. He's going to explain over here what's humans, the, our own sacrifices. It's individuals. Yeah. Thank you. Enjoy. Oh.